Hello, my lovely Misfitians, and welcome back to another video. So the last time I uploaded was probably about two weeks ago. I believe it's two weeks now. And um, the reason for that, I did make a community post about it, is right after Halloween, basically right after I posted my time lapse um, of the little spooky Halloween kitty, probably 24 hours after that, I started to feel really sick. <laughs> And um, I pushed through, but then I slowly got a low grade fever and it was just, my body was like, nope, not doing it. So anyway, needless to say, I'm feeling a lot better, but my body just was not having me do anything for the past basically 10 days. Um, so I'm feeling a lot better and I'm not fully full of energy yet. I kind of still feel like the drag of whatever had me. Um, but I wanted to create a video for this week because um, I just wanted to reconnect, but I didn't want to put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> so this is going to be a chatty kind of talky um, video, but I thought something that I'm currently doing right now is looking online for like Black Friday sales or just art supplies that I kind of want to put on my list of things that I might want to look for in the future for Christmas presents or that type of stuff for myself. <laughs> um, but anyway, I've been kind of making a list and then I thought, well, maybe I should list out stuff that I have purchased over the years that is either meh, I don't really like it or yeah, this is fantastic or you could, you could do without this. Um, but it's nice. So this is going to be a long video. I'm positive for that, but let me go ahead and list out stuff that I have purchased over the years that I, looking back on it now would say yay or nay to. So let's go ahead and start. All right. I'm going to attempt to put my microphone on me. The reason why I, a lot of times I hold it is because sometimes my hair gets in the way and it makes a lot of racket or my clothes. Um, and so I'm going to try and just not touch it. Um, so I can share with you the supplies that I'm talking about. Hopefully the audio will be okay. It's always those fingers crossed with audio. So I'm going to start with the most recent purchase that I did, which was the Frixon. Um, this is the one I did in two videos ago, I believe. Yeah. Right before the time lapse. And this is the erasable pen. Love the idea of it. I really wanted to play around with using it and then completely erasing the lines. Um, so that the paints would really shine through, um, a style that I've kind of been trying to work on is I like a more stylized, um, sharp watercolor look for my particular art style, but at the same time, not being heavily, um, reliant on lines. And so I've been trying to use lighter lead pencils or, um, erasable pen. I thought this would be a really cool idea and really let the colors kind of define the shapes instead of lines defining the shapes of specific objects or animals in my case or people and stuff like that. Um, it worked great in the video, but somebody brought up in that video that they will come back if you use colder temperatures. And at first I was like, well, we actually lost our um, air conditioner and that particular day our air conditioner died and we had to get a new one and replace. Um, that particular day, the temperature was in the 50s and the lines had not come back on the painting. So I was like, it must be really, really cold temperatures because when it was 50 degrees, they did not come back. It was exactly the same way as I had done it. So this person suggested putting it in the freezer, which I did, and the lines came back. <laughs> so they're still very, very light, but you can kind of see, um, there's still like little dots that I put down. So you can kind of see that, which stinks because you don't want those lines coming back if you're trying to erase them. So this was kind of a dud supply in that respect. Um, I haven't tried air drying this again, but after this whole scenario, I was kind of like, dang it, <laughs> I really wanted this to work. So this one, 
I'm really upset <laughs> about. If y'all have any ideas of any other erasable pens that don't do this, I would be very interested in those and um, try other experiments with those. So that's this one. This is another little small supply. I'm just grabbing whatever is near me and then I will share with it. Um, this is called a drafting ruler. I bought this when AC Moore, um, it's a large chain art store, which I absolutely love. Um, it went out of business close to us. Basically they, the company started downsizing. I don't even know if they have any more near us per se, but the one location that I really loved, they um, basically just did a closing sale. And I picked this up on a whim. This particular ruler, it's hard to see, but it's completely clear, but it has lines horizontally as well as vertically. And what's great about this is if I need to make exact, um, basically parallel lines with something, especially I like to make parallel lines with the paper. Um, I know that my papers are cut by the manufacturer in perfect symmetrical things, but if I want the paper maybe not to be a nine by 12, but instead to be an eight and a half by 11 or um, an eight by 10 or a five by seven, I can use this ruler to help me really get a gauge of exactly 90 degree angles and kind of measure back from the paper to make lines and eventually cut down. So this guy, I absolutely love. I use him all the freaking time. Basically it's just called a drafting ruler. They have lots of different versions on Amazon, um, but I use this guy all the time. <laughs> Let's talk brushes next. So for years I've used Grumbacher brushes. These are synthetic um, brushes. And in my opinion, if you're trying to go for more of a synthetic brush, I really, really like the Grumbacher brushes. Um, for smaller brushes, I will use the Winsor & Newton um, Cotman series. They're also synthetic and they're really, really great for tinier brushes. I haven't used a lot of their larger brushes because I haven't been able to get my hands on it. But as you can see, this one, this Grumbacher six round, I use a lot. Now, this particular brush, I love when I don't want a lot of water in my paint. Um, specifically, I want to do maybe like little touch up areas, but I don't want my brush to soak up a lot of water. I want it to be a very vibrant color but at the same time, very controlled. Um, I will still pull out my Grumbacher brushes because since they're synthetic brushes, they're not going to absorb as much water in them compared to my other two brushes that I use and live and die by. And these are, this one right here is Squirrel's Hair along with synthetic. This, a lot of watercolorists use these. It is the black velvet silver line. Um, I highly recommend these. If you want to go one step up from basically a basic student grade synthetic um, brush, this line is fantastic. They're black with like a little silver line. Um, be careful because there are fakes on Amazon that look exactly like this. Make sure you're looking for the black velvet silver. Actually, one of y'all um, gave this to me and I absolutely loved it. At first I didn't because I was kind of like, oh, this soaks up so much water and it was a learning curve based on the synthetic to this one, the natural hair. Um, it was a huge learning curve because it soaked up so much water and so much paint compared to what I was used to. Um, but now I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite brushes to go with. And then if you really want to go pricey, um, I last year went ahead and just bit the bullet and bought a master sable from Blick. And basically this is the highest end of natural hair watercolor brushes. I'm going to say this totally wrong, but it's a Kalinsky, Kalinsky, can't remember how to say that. And I should go look it up, but I'm so tired right now. I don't want to. Um, but basically this is the highest end of what they recommend 
um, for natural hair brushes. And the idea is that once you purchase one of these, these are a lifetime brush. So you'll never have to repurchase this again because they are pricey. Um, I love it. I love painting with these. I have a couple of them. They are very, very pricey, like I said. Um, but the point always stays very, very crisp compared to my synthetic brushes, my Grumbacker, especially the six. The point is not as nice as it was when I first um, purchased these. I can take brush shapener and go ahead and remold it and rework it and stuff like that. But um, the I've just noticed, I've been working with these for a year and they really kept their shape and they just absorb so much water and so much paint that when I'm laying down paint on the paper, um, I don't have to refill my brush as much. So for those of you who know when you're working with watercolor, it's really nice when you don't have to refill your brush as much because then you're not having to basically rework, um, basically dry time is your big issue. So anytime I have to pick up new paint, I always have to make sure there's a section of the paper that is still wet for me to add that new paint in to make the transition seamless between the paint that's already laid down and the paint that's newly fresh coming in. Um, the less you have to do that, the more your lines and your shapes will look more uniform and more smooth in transitions um, from one location to the next. So these are the three brands that I use pretty much nonstop, as well as the Windsor & Newton, um, like I said earlier, Cotman series. I have a couple of those that I use a lot as little itty bitty detail brushes. Several of you have asked me that it's like size zero, size zero, zero, and size zero, 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 zero. I have one that has four zeros on it. Um, I use those a lot for just little details, but I would say these are the ones that I use the most for brushes. Let's talk pens and pencils. So I use the Kimberly General um, Pencil Co. These are really inexpensive and I use 6H as well as 9H. So what does that mean? Um, for most people who go to school, you know a number two pencil. You have to use them for Scantrons and stuff like that. It's a softer lead pencil. But needless to say, I don't like the softer graphite. That's when you're trying to do more of a graphite charcoal type picture. Um, I don't need those. That's not what I need for watercolor. So the higher the graphite is, the harder the lead and the less graphite is going to be put on your paper. So I've noticed that there is this new brand that's out. Um, let me go get it. This guy, the um, Faber Castle, and this is matte pencils. I have not tested these yet. That's the reason why I'm kind of holding off on my opinion on these. Um, but there's a wide range of sizes for these, ranging from hard to soft. Um, but these are considered matte where they're not gonna have that shiny look to it. If you are desiring something like that, but you want very, very sharp lines that are not shiny, that barely leave any graphite on the paper, um, this is your go-to, in my opinion. These are super cheap. <laughs> um, a lot of times I buy them in bulk because I specifically like the 6H and the 9H. The 9H is the hardest lead that you can get for these. Um, and basically they leave very, very thin, very, very light lines. They're also very easy to erase. I use this particular eraser. I cannot remember for the, <laughs> like I said, y'all, brain's dead. Um, I'll go ahead and put the name up here, but basically this eraser is the best for lifting those lines. I do have a kneaded eraser. As you can see, I don't use it a lot because I don't usually need to. Um, a lot of times you use a kneaded eraser to lift up and lighten those lines. I typically don't 
have to do that when I'm using this particular pencil. Next, let's talk about ink. Let's do ink in general. Um, these are my preferred, they are the Sakura um, Micron 005 pens. I have been talking about these forever. I love to use these when I need to do really fine details or very, very teeny lines. Um, they just give me a lot of control when compared to using ink. I love to use the PH Martin's um, black matte ink. Honestly, it's not super matte. It does have a little bit of shine to it. Um, but I just prefer that one compared to the other ones that they offer. It is the least shiny out of the ones that they do sell for the PH Martin's um, brand. This one, the Black Star Matte. Yeah, there we go. Um, ink, it's very, very popular and it's not that expensive. I've had this one for like a year now. I go through it pretty fast because I use it a lot. Um, but if you're not using it a lot, it probably <laughs> will last you for quite a while. Um, but those are my favorite black inks, I would say. And I use my paintbrushes with this um, to get really nice smooth lines or even to get nice loose watery effects. I really like this particular ink for that. I have tried the um, Schmincke Aqua Drops. I did not like them. I know some, several people have been like, yes, I love those. I didn't like them. They did not work for me. Um, they just didn't feel the same way <laughs> as my PH Martins. Um, so yeah. All right, so next let's talk watercolor concentrates. Um, so I have four different types of watercolor concentrates. I have inks to, actually, no, I have three types. I lied to you. I have three types of watercolor concentrates and several inks. I'm going to be just sharing with you one ink, um, brand that I like. Um, the other ones I've tried and I'll explain why I didn't like them. Um, so first let's talk about Echoline. Um, this was very, very popular. A lot of people either love these or they hate these. Um, there are a couple of colors in the Echo line, this one in particular, um, that I love. I absolutely love. I feel like of all the other watercolor concentrates that I played around with, this particular color is not really available. And so I think that's the reason why I gravitate towards it. But Echo line as a whole, I have swatched them a lot um, and I feel like if you're going to be dealing with non-light fast colors, I want to have colors that are super, super vibrant and radiant. So if you had me choose between the Radiant, PH Martin's Radiant line or the Echo line. If you put me in a corner and asked me to choose which one of these I would prefer and which ones I would purchase, I would hands down do the Radiant line. I absolutely love this line. The only thing that I hate about it, and I hate it, is they're not light fast. They are not going to last longer than a year. I know a lot of people are like, oh, they fade within three months. Technically, I've painted with these. My illustrations have not faded that drastically until a year later. Um, unless you are blasting them with sunlight, they're not gonna fade as quickly as a lot of people kind of say. Um, they're like, oh, within three months, they're gonna change color or three months. It's like this three month mark that people are like, die, like dying on basically. Um, maybe some colors, but from what I have seen with the paints that I have used and I've used them for years, I think this is my seventh year on YouTube now. And I've used these for six cause I got them shortly after I started YouTube. Um, I've been painting with them in the background on and off because I just love painting with them. If I feel like, um, 
I'm hitting a creative block, a lot of times I will pull these out and play around with them. Um, but they don't fade as quickly as a lot of people say. <laughs> um, they fade over time, yes, totally agree with that. Do they fade in three months? No, <laughs> not unless you're putting them in direct and direct sunlight. Um, in fact, I have an experiment going on where I have taken these and I have stuck them to my window. They've been there for four months. Um, I'm, and I basically put black tape, um, not black tape, black cardboard paper, um, spe a specific kind to block out the color and I'm leaving them there for six months. So I have a, two more months to go um, before I remove them from my window. And I'm very, very curious as to how much they actually have faded um, with this test that I've done. And the window that I chose in my house is almost direct sunlight in the morning until probably one or two, and then it starts to kind of fade a little bit. Um, so they're getting partial sunlight. So I'm trying to do six months. I might even do seven to eight. Um, cause that would be more of like direct sunlight in three months type thing. Um, but I am doing a test on that. They don't fade as fast as people make them sound. Um, they are fantastic to work with. They actually do um, mix really well with current pigment paints. So I know this is a dye and a lot of times dyes don't mix well with pigment colors. With the Radiant line, not always, I'm gonna put that in there, but I would say probably 70% of my, my current paint colors will mix perfectly fine with the Radiant line, which is one reason why I like to use it because sometimes if I am doing an illustration, I don't really care if it's light fast. Um, I'll add a little bit of a radiant color to my current color. So raspberry is very, very close to opera rose, which both of those are not light fast, but opera rose is a pigment and raspberry of course is a dye from the radiant line. I'll add a little bit of raspberry to my opera rose to give it a little bit more of a punch um, when I'm painting with it. So yeah, love these. Next, let's talk about the Hydrus. Um, so these are the PH Martin's, um, watercolor concentrates that are light fast. And I am going to stop my camera and restart it because it's about ready to turn off. Okay. So back to the Hydrus. These are the Radiant Line watercolors, um, concentrates that are considered light fast. Um, I have a love hate relationship with these. <laughs> um, some of my Hydrus colors, I absolutely love, they work great. Um, but I feel like they are very, very similar to my pigment colors. If I use them directly from the tube and then water them down. So a lot of times I'm thinking to myself, why not just use my pigment paint? when they act very similar to my hydrus. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, oh, I don't know why, <laughs> but almost all of my hydrus do not mix with my pigment colors. So for some reason, the way they do the makeup of the hydrus um, watercolor concentrates, these dyes do not mix well with my pigments when compared to my radiant line. And so as a result, they create these little grain, like flecky textures, and I absolutely hate them. So if I'm using concentrates, I have to make the conscious decision that I'm just going to use concentrates for basically the entire painting. If I'm using pigments such as two paints, I have to make sure that I'm doing the entire painting with just pigments. Um, some of my hydrus line, if I let them dry completely, I can paint over them and not have that weird grainy texture come up. Um, and some of them I can't. So it's a lot of testing. It's a lot of swatching and it's, 
it's honestly frustrating. <laughs> um, so a lot of you have asked, Carrie, why do you swatch so much? Carrie, why do you do so many color charts? Normally because I'm mixing things um, that aren't supposed to be mixed, to be perfectly honest. It's watercolor that breaks the rules. That's the reason why I have that slogan. Um, and as a result, I constantly have to test and make sure that the supply that I'm mixing with the new supply or with an old supply, if I'm testing out stuff, I have to make sure that they're going to work on the paper and not have a, oh no, surprise oopsie happen when I'm right in the middle of an illustration. I do not want to be working on an illustration that can be a four to five hour, hour illustration and I still have maybe five to six hours more to put into it and right in the middle, two supplies do not mesh well and create this weird texture. Um, it just frustrates the living daylights out of me when that happens. So a lot of times I am swatching and testing and practicing with all these different supplies, trying to make sure that they work well together and they will work continually. Um, so there are no surprises when I'm in the middle of an illustration painting it. Um, so for me, um, I would say most of the time I would say I don't like hydras. Um, it's once again, a controversial statement, <laughs> but I, I don't like it. Um, every once in a while I will pick one up and work with it, but it is very, very, very rare because I know the chances of me running into an issue are going to be very, very high unless I paint the entire thing in a hydrus watercolor concentrate color scheme. And a lot of times I don't like that. I like my pigments and my paints. So those are my thoughts. Next, let's talk about inks. Um, so Bombay inks are my favorite color inks. Um, I have tried Royal Talons. I've tried two other kinds and I cannot remember what they are for the life of me. Um, but out of those, and I'm going to preface this, the area where I live in, um, most people don't paint with watercolor. So just recently, the Michaels where I'm at has added an entire aisle dedicated to watercolor. It used to be only a couple of shelves. Um, most people who, where I'm at, if they are an artist, they're into oil or acrylic. So those particular sections, there's tons of those different supplies. There's usually three or four aisles on those particular supplies. And that's just like the paint sections. That's not even including the canvases and all the other supplies that you can get. Um, so watercolor is very limited where I'm at. So a lot of the supplies I either have to purchase online and I have to purchase them full price or sometimes I can find them in my Michaels and use a 50% off coupon and get them cheaper. Um, the other inks that I got, I think they were old. So I'm gonna preface that. Um, and they were goopy. They were incredibly goopy. The, in my opinion, the inks felt more like acrylic paint than they did ink. And I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, um, the ones that I have found that always, always, always act like ink to me are the Bombay, um, variety. Once again, these do not mesh well with pigment colors. They just don't, this is a dye. That's a pigment. Um, so basically two paints, your regular watercolors, they don't mix well. Um, that being said, if sometimes I like to lay these colors down as under coats, they're very, very staining colors. So once you paint them, um, they're not going to lift. If you paint with Bombay ink too thick, it has a shiny, coat on top. Um, 
and you cannot paint over top of it with your watercolor. It will basically act as a resist. Um, but if you water it down a lot and you basically just want to create an undercoat of color before you put your watercolors on top, some colors, not all, that's once again why you're constantly swatching, at least me, I'm constantly swatching. Some colors actually will work really well as a base coat um, that can create nice sharp lines since these are super staining. So you're not gonna be able to lift these up when you paint on top of them. So um, that is one thing that's really nice um, when you're thinking about staining colors. Always try and use those as undercoats for your watercolor paintings. Because what's gonna happen is when you paint over top, none of that color is going to lift. And so you're still gonna create, you're gonna have basically your nice sharp colors and shapes and lines, even though you're laying on top of another color. So um, that's one thing that I like to use with these. Paper. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to have a lot of thoughts on paper right now because I am currently, and I've asked on Instagram and I'm going to ask in this particular video, um, what kind of watercolor paper brands would you like for me to test? I'm doing another version of this. It's not going to be as involved as the last paper series that I did. I went way overboard on that and I burned myself out. Um, but I am collecting papers, see right here. Um, these are all watercolor papers that I have been collecting and basically, um, putting the name on all of these, um, to test in the future. So currently right now, the three brands that I use consistently are Arches, Hot Press, Arches, Cold Press, and um, Fabriano. Those are the three that I use consistently. I have noticed over the past year, I am not liking Arches Cold Press as much as I used to. So <laughs> that's the reason why I'm doing a whole testing once again. Um, the reason is because I'm noticing with my particular art style, what I really want is a paper that acts like cold press in that it absorbs really, really well your paint and your water, but it doesn't have the bumpy texture. So most of you who have followed me, you know that I tested, I believe it was Fabriano um, Soft Press. I loved that loved it. Um, that is no longer available. I looked for it. I couldn't find it. Um, they might be out of stock. So don't take, <laughs> take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, it might not be available right now when I'm looking for it, but it might be in stock in the future. Um, but I love that paper. That paper only came in sheets of watercolor. It did not come in pads. Um, and that's more the type of paper that I really want to paint on. So I'm trying to find other brands that are similar to that, that would work better with my particular style. That being said, I love Arches watercolor paper. I don't want you to hear me wrong. I love Arches cold press watercolor paper, how it acts, how it behaves. I think it's the best watercolor paper that I've ever painted on, but the way it looks doesn't work well for me because I want my paintings to not show up. Basically, I'm going more into of a digital type of look. So after I paint, I want to take a picture of it. And a lot of times when I take a picture of it, you can see the dents and the texture of the paper because it's cold press um, in the camera. I don't want that. <laughs> so I'm trying to find a paper that acts similar to Arches cold press, but doesn't have as much texture to it. 
So that's currently what I'm looking for. I have, I think 16 different varieties right now that I am going to be testing. Some of these I've tested before, some of these um, I've never tested before, so we'll see. But anyway, that's to look forward to in the future that's coming. Um, so I'm not gonna say a lot about paper other than what I just said. Another thing that I absolutely love to work with when working with watercolor, this is kind of a side supply. I've had this for years. It's about $8 to $9. Um, this is iridescent medium. So this is right here. That's what it looks like. It's Windsor and Newton from Windsor and Newton. I love this stuff. Um, so Daniel Smith has, I would say they're the best at this. Hang on. Can you focus on me? There we go. Okay. So Daniel Smith, I would say does the best of producing paints that have iridescent effects to them. I love their lines of like luminescence or um, they have like a, a moon one that I really want to get. It's gorgeous. It kind of has color shifting in it. Um, but yeah, they do the best at that particular thing. I would say out of all the watercolor color brands that I've seen, they offer the most options when it comes to more of this iridescent look or, um, color shifting paints. They offer the most, unless you're going to people such as on Etsy, I've seen a couple of people who make their own and some of those look really fantastic and I would really like to try those out. Um, but they have color shift paints. So those are like small businesses. And then if you go mainstream kind of large business, I would say Daniel Smith does the best. So why am I saying that? If you don't have the money <laughs> to purchase all of their kind of iridescence or their color shift type things, this is going to be your kind of next go-to. So this is iridescent medium. You can add this. You can actually paint this on top of your paper. It's really pretty to do for Christmas illustrations. I would say I like to do them on my scarves for my animals. I like to do them in snow scenes just to kind of add a little bit of extra. Um, and this one has kind of a silvery um, base to it. So it works really nicely with snow. However, you can also add this to your paints, especially if you're working with tubes, you can squeeze out a little bit of your paint on your palette and then add a little bit of this to create your own kind of on your palette, iridescent, um, paint color for with one of your favorite colors that you already have. So I've done that a lot. Um, a lot of times I'll add it. Blues are really nice to add it with because it's got that silvery look. Sometimes I'll even add it to red. Basically, it just has this slight color sheen. It's not gonna be as, I don't want you to think this, it's not going to be as prominent of a color compared to if you get it from Daniel Smith or you get it from someone who makes it on Etsy. Um, but this is kind of like the DIY version. <laughs> of doing it yourself without spending a ton of money. So I would highly recommend if you want to add more iridescent or just little shimmers to your paintings, this is a great way to do it without busting your bank. Next up, since we're talking about shimmers, um, let's talk about the Schminky Aqua Bronze line. So I have all of them. I spent the money. These are super expensive. Um, I have these three. There's one more. Actually, I don't own that one. Um, pale gold, silver, and copper are the colors that I have. And I will show one up to close for you. So these are really, really expensive. <laughs> um, am I glad that I purchased them? Hang on. There we go. Am I glad that I purchased them? Yes, I am. I do use them. Um, do I use them as often as I thought I would? No. So I would consider these more of kind of a meh 
um, supply that I have purchased over the years, because of the price, I can't really justify it. I'm really glad that I purchased these. I love them, but I don't use them that much. Um, and it's basically because I'm usually taking pictures of it and making it more of a digital format. And as a result, you don't see the shimmer on these as much as you typically would. Another cheap way to kind of, you know, DIY it yourself in a cheap, inexpensive way is get some nice gold acrylic paint. Um, it will look kind of similar and you'll use less, but at the same time, if you want the nice, rich look, this is gonna be what you're gonna go for. Um, like I said, I'm really completely torn on this particular supply because I love, when I do use it, I love it. But I have to say within the past two years, I've maybe used it three times. Um, and I just think that's, you know, is that really worth it? Now, I will say this, once you purchase it, there is so much in here, you're gonna be using it um, forever. I almost wish that they had a smaller version size that was a lot cheaper because I don't need this much. <laughs> um, if they had a smaller size, I probably would say, yes, pick it up, because you're probably only gonna use it a couple of times unless you absolutely, absolutely love it. And then you'll be using it all the time. Um, but for me, I don't use it that often. And when I do use it, I like it. But at the same time, a lot of the illustrations that I do just don't call for this particular supply. And if I'm teaching an illustration, I know this particular supply is super expensive. So a lot of times I will opt for a cheaper supply that looks similar um, so that I don't put that pressure on y'all to purchase a really, really expensive supply when you could use a cheaper substitute. So those are my thoughts on the aqua bronze. This might be a little bit controversial, but that's kind of what I think. Let's talk next about basically notebooks, um, journals, sketchbooks, that type of stuff. For years, I have used the mixed media um, Strathmore spiral notebooks. Um, I'm very particular about how my paper feels when I'm drawing on it. That's gonna sound really weird, but um, <laughs> I, for years, my drawing instructor um, and for those of you who don't know, I am self-taught, but I did take um, an incredible drawing class in college from one particular professor. And I took several um, classes in high school for art. And I was, to be honest, <laughs> my drawing professor was incredible, but he always suggested that we use the um, Strathmore drawing books. And I hated the way they felt felt under my hand. So when I was drawing, they always felt really rough. And to this day, I can't stand that feeling. It, it grinds on me. I can't explain why, but it really does. I'm very particular about how my paper feels underneath my hand while I'm drawing. This particular paper really works for me. It's super smooth. Um, and it just is easier to erase on. Um, so I do a lot of my hand kind of drawings on here and my digital drawings I do on my iPad um, via Procreate, which I absolutely love. I use Procreate a lot um, to color in my illustrations and kind of get an idea of what colors and shading I wanna do and then use that as my reference photo for when I'm doing my paintings. Um, this is my favorite so far watercolor journal that I have um, picked up. And this one, I have some drawings in it, but I don't have a lot of paintings so far. So this is me exploring the color wheel. Um, once again, it's kind of a feeling texture thing. Um, this is just a little fox illustration, owl illustration, um, little girl. I do a lot of drawings first in them and then I paint them. This is a newer journal right here. So I don't have a lot of paintings in them, but 
all the ones back there. You can kind of see it. That little portion right there of my bookshelf is all these and it's got paintings inside of them. I don't typically share my paintings um, in my journals because I don't wanna put pressure on myself. My journals are specifically for um, exploration and nobody's supposed to see them because they're supposed to be trash, to be perfectly honest. Um, that's why I purchased these because they're cheap. Um, I really like the watercolor paper. It is hot press compared to cold press. So if you don't like hot press, you might not like it. In my opinion, it's not true hot press because to me, it feels more like a soft press paper um, than a true hot press paper. So those are my thoughts. I really like this particular journal. It's cheap and basically I can trash them. And that's the whole point of these. They're not meant to be preserved. They're meant to be experimented on and played around with. Um, I have done a couple of illustrations in these kind of testing them with full illustrations um, that I do like on this channel. So you can see those. Um, but for the most part, these are my trash journals. And that's what they create. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's perfectly fine. You need a trash journal. You need something that you don't really care what it looks like and you don't care anybody else is supposed to see it. So yeah, talk about paints. So this right here is a list of all of my favorite um, paints that would connect to the color wheel. That being said, the I think four brand, five brands that I use the most in my palette is Winsor Newton, Daniel Smith, Schminky, and Holbin, and I have a couple of core colors. Um, those are the five brands that I use the most. I am very much a person who is not necessarily ride or die brand. This is the only brand that I paint with. I know some artists are very much like that, the way I see it when I'm talking about brands is that some brands do some colors better than others. That's kind of how I see brands. So I'm gonna try and break down brands the way I see them. <laughs> um, some of this is going to be very controversial, but this is kind of the way I see them based on my art style and based on how I approach watercolor. So personally, I like my paint colors when they're on paper to be as smooth and as solid of a color as possible. My key is smooth. I don't like a lot of granulation in my paint colors. The brands that do that the best, in my opinion, are um, Windsor & Newton, and Schminky. Those two, the way they grind up their pigments, I feel like they are the sleekest, smoothest paint colors. I'm not talking about the student grade, I'm not talking about Winsor Newton Cotman series, that's a whole different beast. I'm talking about the professional artist grade watercolors. Winsor & Newton, I feel like is would be my top it's the one that makes up most of the colors that I have in my repertoire of paints. Um, most of their colors I find are the sleekest and smoothest when I paint them on the paper. Um, after that would be Schminky. I find a lot of their colors, not all, um, are very sleek and smooth. Um, and it's just because of how they make their colors. That being said, Daniel Smith has the best greens, in my opinion, compared to all the brands. So I have swatched Winsor Newton greens. I have swatched Schminky greens. Um, I've swatched Core greens. I've swatched Holbin greens. Um, I've swatched M. Graham greens. I really, really love Daniel Smith greens. They do greens fantastic. 
So if you want a good green, you need to go to Daniel Smith. <laughs> um, I believe all of my greens, except for three, um, are Daniel Smith. Um, I basically lean very, very heavily towards Daniel Smith when it comes to my greens. That being said, Daniel Smith, if you want a variety of colors, meaning you want a color that you kind of come up with in your head and you're like, I really want this pretty purple that has just a hint of pink to it. Windsor and Newton is most likely not going to have it. Their colors are more limited and more concentrated. So they have less colors um, compared to Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith has a lot more colors. And in my opinion, if you're looking for a specific color that you don't wanna to have to mix over and over and over again, you're mostly going to find it via Daniel Smith. They have just a ton of colors. They're really good at making different colors. They're really good at producing them. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I think of Daniel Smith. That being said, Daniel Smith, I have found a lot of the colors, not all, a lot of them do leave a texture. It's not necessarily a granulation. I don't really know how to explain it. They don't necessarily leave a granulation on the pa paper because some of their colors are like, these are non-granulating, but yet I still see this slight texture when I compare that paint color to my Windsor and Newton ones. Um, and that's the reason why I like my Windsor and Newton ones better. If you like granulation and you like texture and you want that in your paintings, Daniel Smith is the way to go. I can totally see why so many people are like gun ho diehard Daniel Smith fans. Because a lot of times, if you look at their illustrations, they like the texture, they like the looseness of things, and they like being able to show different just flecks of texture. It's, it's hard to explain. It kind of has this really unique granulating feel to it. I don't know why Daniel Smith doesn't advertise that more because if you love that, you're going to love Daniel Smith. Um, I am not into that. <laughs> The, the paint illustrations that I like to do, I like them to look more digital. I like them to look more flat. I like them to look more um, smooth, almost a 3D um, blender kind of look if you were doing something in digital art. I like my paintings to look more like that. And as a result, that's why I tend to steer a little bit clear of Daniel Smith. Now, like I said, their greens are fantastic. I have so many greens in my palette currently that I use of theirs. Um, so I would say in my hierarchy, color would be the number one category of, do I like this color? Second would be, does it create a texture that I like or I don't like? And then thirdly, how well does it mix with my other paints as well as apply to the paper? So anyway, that is Windsor Newton, Schminky, um, Daniel Smith. Next, I wanna talk about Holbin. So many people stinky poo on Holbin watercolors. And my camera just stopped. Okay, so so many people stinky poo on Holbin brand as a whole. I totally get that, but if you're looking at Holbin watercolors based on a traditional watercolor approach, yes, they're more chalky and they're more opaque. Holbin watercolors does pastel watercolors like no other brand. So if you want pastel watercolors, Holbin is the way to go. No other brand for watercolor has a better pastel palette than Holbin. Shell pink, is fantastic. It is one of my favorite, favorite pink colors. It's like a ballet shoe pink. So if you want a ballet shoe pink watercolor, Holbin is the way to go. If you want more of a sky blue 
color that is not granulating. Holbin has the best color for that. <laughs> it's Horizon Blue. It is fantastic. They are chalky because they have white in them. Um, lavender is another really, really good one that has this pastel kind of purpley blue. Um, it kind of has a moody, in my opinion, it's like a moody, um, snowy day color. Um, leaf green is another one. It's um, that new, new growth green that you would see on leaves in the spring. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that they have. Bright orange is another one that's really nice. Brilliant pink is another one that's really nice. Bright rose is a very like fluorescent purpley pink. Um, but that being said, Holbin knows how to do pastel watercolors. So if you're looking for a pastel watercolor palette or a pastel watercolor um, tubes of paint to purchase, look at Holbin. They're really, really nice. Perfect. All right, and the last thing I wanna talk about, there's other supplies that I could talk about, but I'm gonna cut it here because I, I have a feeling this is gonna be almost an hour long. Um, since we're talking about paints, I wanna talk about these. This is how I chose what colors I wanted to purchase without killing my bank account. So before I realized that these were available, I would just purchase paints based on what other people said or based on what I saw online. And I was like, oh, that looks like a cute color. Um, and then I'd get it and I'd be like, I hate this color. <laughs> and then you can't do anything about it because you purchased it and you have opened it and it is yours. Um, that's partially how my little box of paints ended up being huge. Um, so these are little dot charts. This is Winsor & Newton's dot chart. And basically what they do is they put, you can kind of see it more here. They put a little dot of watercolor down. And then what they do is they put all the specifics down. Hang on, come on, quit looking at me and look at this. They put all the specifics down underneath of that particular paint color. Um, so they'll tell you like, is it granulating? Is it staining? Is it opaque? Is it transparent? Um, and what's nice about this is you can test every single color that they have available from this particular brand and make a more wise decision of what kind of paints you actually want. So a lot of times, and most of us know this, when you're looking at a digital display, that color might not be exactly what you are looking at compared to something that is in a physical form. So that's the reason why they put these out as well as all the details for the paint. Um, I use these all the time. So this one, I don't have Holbins. Um, but they do have one for Holbin too. This is Schminky. So this is their version of it. They have 140 colors, which they're really good with um, colors as well, similar to Daniel Smith. They're just so stinking expensive sometimes. Like, especially now, they're like 20 bucks a tube. It's incredible. Um, but yeah, this is their version. And once again, they have like all the details. Um, so you can see if it's staining, what pigment, all of that. And basically once again, they're a dot and then you can take your um, brush and pull it out and see kind of what it would look like. Um, see what it would look like with you painting it. Another thing that's nice is like you can actually pick up some of the paint after you've wet it and then put it on your palette and mix it with other colors that you already currently have to see if it works with your current paints. Um, this is Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith, theirs comes in a little 
plastic packet. See, they have 240. <laughs> Daniel Smith beats everybody with color <laughs> and the variety of colors that they have. They have 240, it says right here, color chart. Um, so there you go. But see, you can see like some of these I haven't swatched. Um, basically because I'm not interested in those colors. The ones that I have swatched, I am interested in. Um, but see, these are fantastic. These are worth every freaking penny. Now I will say this, um, this is their like iridescent line. These, you're gonna have to use directly from the tube. I have wet these cause I'm very interested in these um, and they don't lift very easily. So once you wet these, they kind of just stick. Well, I'm sorry, once you put these down, it's very evident once they put these down on the paper and they dry, they kind of turn into like glue. And so they don't lift very easily after even wetting them. They're very, very solid and like glue. So in my brain, I know if I purchase these, first off, I don't want to put them in my palette because they're going to get stuck and I'm not going to be able to use them. So I'm going to have to use these specifically fresh from the tube. So that's another thing that's really nice to, um, think about when you're using like a dot chart. Um, some colors even are, are artist brand, um, colors, some colors, um, when you wet them, they become almost like a liquid and they come, they bring about, basically you can pick up all of that vibrant color immediately, almost as if you're getting it directly from the tube. However, some colors are more like glue. It's just basically how they're made and how they're put together. Um, so they're not going to lift as easily and you're just going to have to use those directly from the tube. So, hey. And it is several hours later. So if you hear a little pitter pattering, it's the dogs walking around. Um, right in the middle while I was filming, we had a little bit of a family emergency and we had to go to urgent care real quick. Everybody is fine. Um, everything is good, but basically my husband had to go to urgent care. <laughs> And so we went there and we just got back literally just now. Um, once again, everyone's fine, but that's kind of how life has been recently. It's just kind of been one thing after the next. Um, but anyway, you probably hear the little poopers, the poopers right here. Hello. You going to jump up? Come on. Show people the camera. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh my god, here's the other one right here. I know my movies. <laughs> so anyway, you get to see the little puppers. Um, but I did want to sign off. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was kind of just a chatty video of my thoughts on different supplies and other things. Um, if you want me to do more of this type of thing, please make sure to like this video so I know. And um, yeah, I can do little chatty different videos in the future. Um, I have a couple of ideas, Pepper just moved my camera. I have a couple of ideas of just chatty videos that I could do in the future. If you enjoy these types of things, this is going to be a very long format video. Um, it's very different from what I usually do, but I have a couple of ideas in more this particular style. So if you like this style of video, please make sure to like it so that I know you like this style. Um, but anyway, yeah, lots of love y'all. I am going to go to sleep because it has been a long day and wake up and start the day anew tomorrow. So lots of love y'all. Happy painting. And I will see you next time. Bye.